I want you to forget everything that you think you know about prayer. As we begin this series, and I mean everything you think you know about prayer, get rid of it. Because here's the baseline truth that I know looking back over my own life and even things I've taught and things I think, much of what I have been taught or think about prayer is just flat out wrong. So let's start over, okay? Let's start from a, a clean slate. And I know some of you have some heavy baggage that you're bringing into this prayer conversation. Some of you have been part of, of, of cultures that were really weird about prayer. And some of you are coming out of cultures that were really bleh about prayer. That very rarely even talked about it and what it should be. But can we start with a blank slate and a huge amount of expectation? Can we do that? Which means you've got to put down anything you feel you feel about prayer. And I've had to do this. I'm in the process of doing this. Forget this idea that prayers are not effective or that my prayers are not effective. And that's going to be hard to do because for most of us, we have a long history of ineffective weak prayers, don't we? I mean, we read stories about people praying over something and healing happening. And we think, man, that is great. I wish I could have that, but I know it's never going to happen. Stop that. Stop it. Can we at least agree on that this morning? Now, I'm going to give one little caveat. If you have powerful and effective prayers, then you can go home. Because I don't want to break anything. I don't want to change something. And there are people in this room that are that way. So I don't want you to forget everything, you know, just maybe a couple things that you know, okay? But for most of us, are we in agreement that it's probably a good idea for us to toss out everything we think we know about prayer? And start fresh, start brand new. And by the way, when you look at a verse like James 5, 16, with fresh eyes, what should we expect? When we pray, what should happen? Stuff should happen. God stuff should happen. Is that possible? Yes. Is it possible for you to pray and to have power and effectiveness in your prayers? Yes. The answer is yes. But the enemy has sold us a lie. Uh, I'm not so sure. So we're going to start over. And I'm going to start with two questions. And, and I'm not going to answer these completely today, partially, but these are two questions we're going to answer until we've had got them answered and, and we're solid on what prayer is, okay? Number one, biggest question is, why does God ask us to pray? And I think this is a question in the back of many of our minds. Because we know one, if we know anything about God, what do we know about God? God knows everything. God knows everything. So why do I need to pray and tell God something? In fact, Scripture even says, God knows what you need before you ask. Well, that just seems silly then, doesn't it? And I think very often we feel silly. Well, if God knows, why am I telling Him? And what are the answers we've heard? Now remember, this is an example of things we're going to put down because I think we've been told some pretty bad things. Well, I tell him, here's the big one. Here's the big religious one. I tell him so that I'll be changed because I need to do it. Do you know what you need? Do you? Well, if you don't know what you need, what are you going to ask for? Do you know what you want? Do you know why you're there? Yes, so that's not it. There's something, and part of the problem, and I'm going to be, you're going to be annoyed with me by the time this series is done, because I think we've been sold a terrible pill about prayer as an excuse for weak, ineffective prayers. Instead of trying to really figure it out, we've dumbed it down. No more. Why does God ask us to pray? I'm not answering that yet. I just want that kernel there, okay? Can we at least agree on this, that if God is asking us to pray, there's a good reason? It's mind-boggling that we don't know. Number two, as mind-boggling, what does prayer do? And these two questions go hand in hand. Why does God ask us to pray, and what does it do? And 
an example of how deeply ingrained some of this is in us. As I sat down with staff to talk about, I asked this question, what does prayer do? And you know what? These are pastors. These are men of God, men and women of God who've been praying their whole lives. And I said, what does prayer do? And I got all the obligatory answers, right? But when I said, no, no, no. What does it literally do? You know what the answer was? I don't know. What does it do? Does it do something? Some of you aren't so sure. And I'd rather you weren't so sure if you're not sure. We're going to answer these two questions. Why does God ask us to pray? And what does prayer actually do? Are you ready to have some answers? Me too. So I want to begin by telling you a story. And I'm taking that off so that you can listen to me. It's a story about a man. And it's a very godly, righteous man. And he determined that he was living in a time that stuff needed to happen. Some big stuff. Very much like our time. Would you agree that there are things in our world that need to change? Are there things in your family that need to change? How about our community? How about your own life? See, this guy was kind of in the same place. Now, in his case, the, the place where he lived had been going through a drought for three and a half years. Now, here in Colorado, and if you're from California, we know what it's like not to, in fact, this stuff falling out of the sky, for those of you who've been here your whole life, is called rain. It's water falling from the sky. And I know it's weird for us to see. In fact, if, if it rains longer than about an hour in Colorado, we go into deep depression. Well, this guy had been living, worse, his whole nation had been living in a severe drought for three and a half years. But he determined it was time for that to come to an end. And so this man decided he was going to do something about the fact that it had not rained for three and a half years. So do you know what this man did? What did he do? He got there. He got to praying. But before he prayed, you know what he did? He climbed a mountain. He climbed a mountain. He got on the very top of this mountain. And he knelt down. And he worshipped God. Now there's no record of what the man said as he was worshipping God. There's no record of what happened while he was worshipping God. But we know what was on his heart. He wanted it to rain. And he had a friend with him who wasn't so sure about this whole prayer make it rain thing. I mean, I'm sure he wanted to make it rain, right? That means a whole different thing nowadays, right? We're not talking about that kind of make it rain. His friend watched him praying, and he wasn't so sure. He had some doubts. Anyone ever had doubts while you're praying or while somebody else was praying? And so he would come to his buddy and go, uh, how's it going? And the man who's kneeling and worshiping and praying would say, go look. Go look. And so his buddy would be like, okay, that's kind of weird. We're on a mountain. <laughs> so I guess he went to the edge and he'd look and guess what he saw all around him? Blue skies. Clear sky. As clear as clear could be. And he came back to his buddy and he's like, see, prayer doesn't work. It's not working. And his, 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 just don't, go look again. And so he went and he looked again. And guess what he saw? Nothing. But he came back. See? Doesn't work. And so he came back. He said, no, go look again. <sighs> so his buddy went and looked again. Still nothing. Blue skies. Came back. It's not working. I'm sure he was praying. That's me praying, right? Because I don't know if it was silent. I don't know if his eyes were open. I have no idea what he was doing. But... Okay, go look again. And he went and he looked again. It, nothing there. He came back. Man, if you and I had gone through this by number five, you know what we would have said? Stop it! It's not working! In fact, very often we say that when we pray, don't we? I mean, I prayed five times. And he came back to the man. He said, nope, go check again. Number six. And he came back. And the man's on his knees, and he says, there's still nothing. He says, I want you to go check one more time. And this time the man went out, and he looked, and he saw way off in the distance a cloud the size of a human fist. That big. 
And he came back and he said, it's working! And the man on the ground said, I know, you better get on your horse and get moving because it is about to rain like you have never seen it rain before. And if you don't get moving right now, you're going to get stuck here and you need to go see the king right now. And guess what it started to do? Oh, it rained. And it rained big. Now, anyone ever heard that story before? Who's the main character of this story? Elijah. Man by the name of Elijah. And this is coming off of right after he's on Mount Carmel and he's challenging the priests of Baal and God sends lightning down right after that. Oh, by the way, it hadn't rained for three and a half years because Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. It was his fault. And now he decides it's over and he kneels down on the top of a mountain and he makes it rain. Is that power? Is that effective? Is that, are those wonderful results? Yes. That's awesome, isn't it? Wouldn't it be awesome if you and I could have that kind of power in prayer? Grab your Bibles. Turn to James chapter 5, verse 16. Now, if you've been paying attention, you'll remember James 5, 16. It's the verse we've been talking about all morning. But I want to put it into context for you. And I want you to look it up in your Bibles because I want you to see it with your own eyes. I want you to know I didn't make it up and just put it on a screen and you're going to trust me. I want you to see it. Are you ready? The first part of 16 says, Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We're going to deal with that whole thing another time. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Elijah was as human as we are, and yet when he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. Then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crops. We read that and we say, yay for Elijah. <laughs> But we miss something very important in this verse. At the beginning of 17, what does it say? Elijah was just like you. He was as human as you and I are. There was nothing special about Elijah and his prayers. What does that tell you? Why would Paul tell us that? Because it's true. What should you take from that? You can pray like Elijah. Uh-oh. Now, some of you, here's what I would like half of you to do. Be praying for no rain, and the other half be praying for rain. They'll cancel each other out. <laughs> can you produce that kind of result and have that kind of power? And I'm talking literally. See, here's the other thing we do is we take this, oh, metaphorically, amen, brother, yep, mm-hmm. I can make it rain. No, no. Can you and I pray and the heavens stop raining? Yes. Can you and I pray and it begins to rain? Do you believe that? At the core of your being, do you believe that that's possible? And not only possible, see, Elijah just didn't think God could do it. What did he believe? He knew God would do it. He could see it in his mind's eye. That's why as he's kneeling and his buddy keeps going, it's not happening. What does he keep doing? Go look. It's coming. And as soon as just a fistful of clouds showed up, what did Elijah say? Oh, it's going to get wet. You better get moving, pal, because stuff is about to happen. You are Elijah. I am Elijah. We have this kind of power. In fact, let me clue you in on something. You have something Elijah didn't have. You have the Holy Spirit on your side, and Elijah didn't have that. In fact, you have an advantage that Elijah didn't have. Do you understand that? You say, Pastor, why are you being so uptight about this? 
because I'm tired of it. I'm tired of us having doubt when we go to prayer. And because we have doubt when we pray, the next time we go to pray, we have more doubt, which means nothing happens. Because God said, Jesus said, when you doubt, it's not going to happen. So part of the problem when we're praying and nothing is happening is we don't think anything's going to happen. That has to change. Huh. Man, you got to come to all my sermons. I, I just love it. I love you, brother. Let me ask you this. I want to ask you an important question. Where do you want it to reign in your life? Now, when I put this up on the board, I actually had to change this. Because when I originally put this up here, it said, where does God want it to reign in your life? But I think that's one of the problems we have. We're always looking for what God wants. Now, you're going to say, Pastor, how can you say that? Of course, do we want what God wants? Yes. But can I tell you that God's going to do what God wants to do? Yes. So can we stop worrying about that? God's going to do what God's going to do. You cannot trump. There are certain, and we're going to talk about this in more length, there are certain variables in prayer. And one of those variables is God does what God wants to do. And you can't change that. I don't care how badly you want something different. You can pray all you want that the Big Mac will not add inches to your waist. But it's God's will. It's not going to change. When you are praying something inside of God's will and you know it, it's going to happen. So the question is not, what does God want to happen? My question for you is, where do you want it to reign in your life? Now, here's, and here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes right now. And I want you to imagine it. Imagine what you want to be different in your life. And you can be as, I don't care in this moment, be selfish that's okay. It can be about you. It can be about someone you know. It can be about the, our community. It can be about the world. I don't care. Small, big, doesn't matter. Where do you want it to reign? What do you want to see change in your life? Can you imagine it? When you've imagined it, I want you to open your eyes. I want you to look at me. Can you imagine it? Can you see something right now that isn't yet? Can you do that? Do you know that we are the only animals on the planet that have that capability to imagine something that isn't? Do you know that? Where did that come from? God gave you that. God put that in you. God gave you an imagination. God gave you creativity. Why? So that we could paint things like the Mona Lisa and put them up in a museum so they can never be touched or seen or done with again? Is that why God gave us creativity and imagination? And we love imagination in kids, don't we? Oh, we I mean, Ben right here. He's probably been drawing all morning. Have you been drawing all morning? Yep. No one got upset with him one time. Okay, maybe mom did because he wasn't paying attention. But outside of that, in fact, when kids bring us stuff, even when it's terrible, what do we do with it? We put it on the fridge. And we, oh, look how creative they are. And we make other people come in and pretend like it's good. It's not. It's terrible. But it's creative and we see the imagination. We see that kids can make things and create things that, are, that don't even exist. And there's something brand new. And there's something in that that we love because we've lost it as we get older. Life crushes it out of us, doesn't it? But we need to reclaim that. I want to show you a passage of scripture that should change your prayer life. And you've done already this morning what God is inviting us to do that will change our prayers. Are you ready for it? And it comes back to these two questions. Why does God ask us to pray and what does prayer do? Look at this verse. Ephesians 3.20. Anyone ever heard of Ephesians 3.20? It says, He, who's the He? God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or Right there. Do you see it? What's that word right there? Imagine. See, when we read this verse, we put a period right here. God can do more than we ask. And so we ask, baby boy, do we ask. We ask God to fix all of our problems. In fact, we've turned prayer almost into coercion. It's almost like God's a genie, right? 
And we get three wishes, and we're being very careful because we're not sure when the wishes run out. We're not called to coerce God. Although we're going to come back later in, in this series to a whole conversation that a couple guys in the Old Testament had with God and, and a phrase that said they changed God's mind. That's mind-boggling. Does God change his mind? We know the answer. What's the answer? The answer is no. God doesn't change his mind. God never changes, right? Want to bet? Put, that, put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that. See, we stop at asking God things, but that's not all we're supposed to do. What else are we supposed to do? Imagine some things. In fact, what does, why does God ask us to pray? Let's come back to this. Why does God ask us to pray? Because he is inviting us into partnership to create things in this world that do not exist right now. He's inviting us into partnership with him. He's asked us, he's given us imagination and creativity so that we can create what does not exist. And he's given it to righteous, holy people so that they will imagine good, powerful things. And he wants to get behind those things, but he wants us to go first. He wants us to imagine them. And then he will do more. He says, you think it. You think the good things. You think what you want to see happen in this world, and I will give them to you, and I'll do even more than what you ask or imagine. What does prayer, why does he ask us to pray? Not to convince him of something, and not just to give a laundry list of things, but so that we can be involved in the process of changing the world. Yeah. Number two, what does prayer do? Prayer does a lot. And we're going to get deeper into this. Prayer changes things. It brings into existence things that were not there. Now, there are boundaries to that. You don't get to pray that a Ferrari will show up in your, in your home. You don't. Well, you can pray it, and you can imagine it. And I, you know what? I don't even want to say it. See, I've got to stop thinking. Outside. We're going to think outside the box, right? Pray for a Ferrari. Pray for it. I'd rather you are praying imaginatively than praying boring, weak, stupid prayers. Amen. I'd rather you are praying that the Ferrari showed up and pray it with fervent, oh, I believe it, God, I can see it. I can picture it. I don't know, maybe God will give you a Ferrari. I don't know. That's part of the problem. We don't know. We don't know what God wants to do, but we can imagine. And I want to call you to imagine. Here's what I'm calling you to do, ultimately. I got to get there because I went backwards. Stop hedging your bets in prayer and start partnering with God to create what he wants to create. Yes. Stop hedging your bets. And I do this all the time. Here's, and I want to strike this phrase from the Christian prayer lexicon. God, I want this thing and I want it so bad. If it's your will. Stop saying that. And I, Pastor, you just said stop saying God's will? Yeah. Because the way we do it is to hedge our bets. At least that's what I'm doing it for. Here's the, here's the subconscious thing that's going on in my mind. God, this is what I want. And I'm asking for it and I'm believing it. But if it doesn't happen, I want to throw this caveat in there so that when it doesn't happen, it's not my fault, it's yours. All right? Now, now, can you find anywhere in Scripture... Where that prayer was prayed. Not my will, but yours. There's one. When did it, was, oh, that's a big one. It's a big one. Where did it happen? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. But he was praying in that case, listen to me, against something he knew was contrary to God's will. He knew it. He knew he was going to the cross. And he knew it was big. So I'll give you this. If you're asking for something that you know deep down in your heart is against God's will, then you can say, but your will be done. Otherwise, get rid of it. Pray in faith. That's what we're called to do. Pray as if you believe it's going to happen. That's what we're called to do. We're called to have power and effectiveness in our prayers. So forget everything you know about prayer and start praying creative 
prayers. Now, I can imagine some pretty awesome things. And I've been praying for you. I prayed for something creative to happen this morning, something big and bold and powerful to happen this morning. Okay? Let's stop hedging our bets. Let's start creating some stuff with God. How's that sound? Now, should you have conversations with God? Yes. I'm talking about something different. Coming to God with something you want to see. And here's my real thing. I want you to pick one or two things, and I just want you to begin to see them in your mind's eye and asking God to help you accomplish that. And guess what he says? If, if more of us begin to do that, stuff really starts to happen.